Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is going to cover two of our eukaryotic kingdoms, Kingdom Protista and Kingdom Fungi. So I just want to start by reviewing what it means to belong to the domain eukarya. If you belong to the domain eukarya, that means you have eukaryotic cells. And remember, eukaryotic cells means that your genetic information is contained within a nucleus. It also means you have those fancy membrane-bound organelles, so some of the structures we learned about earlier in the year, like the mitochondria and the chloroplast, the Golgi body, the endoplasmic reticulum. Eukaryotic cells are larger and more complex. So there are four kingdoms that belong to the domain eukarya. Kingdom Protista, Kingdom Fungi, Kingdom Plantae, and Kingdom Animalia. They belong to the domain eukarya because they all have eukaryotic cells. That is really the only thing that these organisms all have in common with each other. And today we're going to be looking at two of those kingdoms, Kingdom Protista and Kingdom Fungi. So where did these eukaryotic cells come from? How did we go from ancient bacteria, prokaryotic cells, to the multicellular complex animals that we have today? Um, this is explained in the endosymbiotic theory. This explains the origin of eukaryotic cells. It sort of gives us an idea of where eukaryotic cells came from. And the idea is that at one time, millions or billions of years ago, there were only prokaryotic organisms, so only bacteria. And at one time, a larger prokaryote came across a smaller prokaryote, and it thought, hey, that looks pretty tasty. I want to eat it up. And so that's what it did. It gobbled it up. It engulfed it. And instead of having its enzymes digest it like it normally would, they sort of started growing and living symbiotically as if they were a single organism. So when they divided, that smaller prokaryote divided inside of it as well. And the idea is that smaller prokaryote became the organelles that we're familiar with today. There's a lot of evidence that supports this, but the biggest one being organelles like the mitochondria and the chloroplast have their own separate genetic information, nucleic acids, inside of them. So that means that probably at one time they were their own independent living organism. The very first eukaryo eukaryotic organisms to appear are what we refer to today as protists. Right now, protists belong to their own kingdom, Kingdom Protista, but there is a lot of sort of controversy about whether this should be its own separate kingdom or whether we should split them up into animals, plants, and fungi, and you'll see why in just a second. We call this the junk drawer kingdom because there's sort of a little bit of everything here, right? You know how at home you have that junk drawer where like it does, all that stuff doesn't really fit anywhere else, so you just sort of throw it all in a drawer together? That's exactly what Kingdom Protista is like. The only defining characteristic that they all have in common is that they are eukaryotic. So some protists are unicellular, some protists are multicellular, some protists are autotrophic, they photosynthesize, they make their own food, some protists are heterotrophic, they have to consume other things, some protists reproduce asexually, and some protists reproduce sexually. The idea is that they don't really fit anywhere else, so we put them all together, but that's probably going to change here in the future when we go to classify things. So right now, scientists classify protists based on how they obtain their nutrition. So there are three categories of protists, animal-like protists, plant-like protists, and fungus-like protists. And animal-like protists, like animals, are heterotrophic. Plant-like protists, like plants, are autotrophic. Fungus-like protists, like fungi, are saprotrophic, meaning they're decomposers. There are three protists that you are going to be expected to be familiar with, the amoeba, the paramecium, and the euglena. So you're going to have to draw these images in a second. Um, you could either pause on this slide or you'll see them again in just a minute. So let's start with those animal-like protists. Animal-like protists are referred to as protozoans. The Greek origin of that word means the first animals. These are probably the ancestors to our modern-day animals. So what makes them animal-like? Why do we call them that? Because they are heterotrophic. They have to consume other things in order to get their food and their energy. Examples would be amoeba, paramecium, stentor, which is what this picture is right here, and plasmodium. So you're going to want to pause on this slide, and you are going to want to draw and label the amoeba and the paramecium. After you pause, then you can continue on. The amoeba, which is an animal-like protist, um, it's unique because it moves with what's called pseudopods, or false feet. 
basically they have two types of cytoplasm. They have a really thin cytoplasm inside called endoplasm, and they have a really thick cytoplasm on the edge of their cells called ectoplasm. And when they push that endoplasm towards the ectoplasm, the ectoplasm stretches and creates sort of this like temporary leg or arm or whatever you wanna call it. That allows them to sort of creep along and move, right? They, they're sort of always stretching and pulling, and it also allows them to wrap around substances that they want to eat and engulf them into the cell. Paramecium are unique, so another type of uh, animal-like protist because they have two nuclei, a big one and a small one. So the big one is right here, the macronucleus, and you can't really see the small one in this image, but it's the micronucleus. The macronucleus controls all the functions that are happening in the cell. The micronucleus controls the reproduction of the paramecium, and they're unique because they move with cilia, all these tiny little hairs surrounding the cell. Um, you'll notice that all protists have these contractile vacuole structures, these star-like structures. That helps them to remove excess water from the cell, and they're typically found in um, wet environments, so it would make sense that they wouldn't want to get too full of water. Okay, now moving on to plant-like protists. Plant-like protists are collectively known as algae. Okay, if you hear someone say algae, they're talking about a plant-like protist. How are they like plants? What makes them plant-like? It's because they are autotrophic photosynthesizers, meaning just like plants, they produce their own food using the energy from the sun. And actually, about 70% of the Earth's oxygen comes from the photosynthesis that's happening inside of plant-like protists and not actually plants themselves, which is pretty crazy. Plant-like protists are very diverse and they are difficult to classify, but some of these you've probably heard of before. Phytoplankton, um, algae, different types of algae you've heard of. Euglena is going to be one of the ones that you are expected to know. Diatoms are actually used as the abrasive chemical in, or the abrasive um, structure in toothpaste, which is pretty crazy. So you can see there's a lot going on here. There is a thickener in ice cream that is made using protists. Like we said, toothpaste, sushi, that seaweed, right? That's a type of protist, so very diverse. Euglena is the, the, the plant-like protist that you are expected to be familiar with, so you're gonna wanna pause on this slide and draw this picture. Um, unique things about the euglena, they move with the flagella, right? Sort of that whip-like tail. They have a red eye spot that allows them to detect light, which is good because they are photosynthesizers. They are full of chloroplasts, um, where photosynthesis is actually happening. And again, they have those contractile vacuoles. Now, euglena are unique, unique because they are photosynthesizers, but they can also consume other organisms um, just like a heterotrophic animal-like protist would. We've heard of algal blooms before. We've talked about that in class, um, but an algal bloom is an explosion of protists. This is caused when food is plentiful, conditions are favorable, right? We talked about how fertilizers can cause this, and that allows your plant-like protists to explode in number. And what happens is when they die, um, when the algae dies, it depletes the nutrients and the oxygen from the water, which actually kills and suffocates the fish that are in the water and all the other marine life that's there. Okay, now moving on to fungus-like protists. So let's start by asking ourselves, well, how are they fungus-like? They're fungus-like because just like fungi, they are saprotrophic, meaning they are decomposers. Like fungi, they use spores for reproduction. Now here's something about how they are not like fungi. Fungi have cell walls made of chitin. Fungus-like protists have cell walls made of cellulose, which is one reason why we classify them as a protist and not as a fungus. This includes things like slime molds, which is what you see here, which you may, you actually can find that around the creeks um, in this area, water molds and downy mildew, all examples of fungus-like protists. Okay, so what do I need to know? What do I need to remember about Kingdom Protista? Key things to remember, they are all eukaryotes. Even though it's Protista, they are all eukaryotic. We call it the junk drawer kingdom because there's a little bit of everything. They're classified as animal-like, plant-like, or fungus-like because um, of the way that they obtain their nutrition. The, the protists you are responsible for knowing are amoeba and paramecium, which are two animal-like protists, and the euglena, which is a plant-like protist. So now we're gonna move on to our next eukaryotic kingdom, which is kingdom fungi. So what are the characteristics of a fungi? Why are they classified into this kingdom together? Well, first of all, they're all eukaryotic. They belong to the domain eukarya. They are all heterotrophic, okay? Fungi do not photosynthesize. They are what we call saprotrophic, which means that they are decomposers. 
They contain filament called hyphae, and they have cell walls made of chitin. Most fungi are multicellular, but there is one group of fungi that are unicellular, and those are your yeasts. Okay, some important fungi structures. Like I said, they have a cell wall. Their cell wall is made of chitin, which is actually the same structure that's in the exoskeletons of arthropods. So like your insects and um, even your crabs and your lobsters and things like that. They have filaments called hyphae that make up the body of the fungus. And you'll see this in a diagram in just a second. But by having this sort of stringy body, it allows them to have much more surface area for obtaining nutrients in a very small space. Then underneath the ground, there's a network of that filament, and that is called mycelium. So the underground portion is called mycelium. This is the main portion of the fungus. It's actually found underground, and you can't see it. The part that pops up that we typically think of when we, when we hear a fungus is called the fruiting body. That is only used for reproduction. So those of you who like mushrooms on your pizza, you actually like to eat the reproductive organs of a fungus on your pizza. It's awesome, right? So the fruiting body pops up, but the actual major portion of the fungus, the main body of the fungus, is the mycelium that is underground, that network of branching filaments. Okay, so all fungi are heterotrophic. So what do they do? Do they, are they like us? Do they ingest and then they digest inside? Or do they digest outside and then ingest those nutrients? They digest, they break down materials, dead and decaying materials using enzymes outside of their body. They release enzymes. And then they absorb those nutrients. So they actually digest first and then ingest the nutrients. There are three ways that fungi can obtain their nutrition. They can be true saprophytic fungi, which means they feed on dead and decaying uh, substances, so like your typical mushrooms that you think of. Fairy ring mushrooms grow in a circle because the spore drops and the hyphae grow out, and then when it rains, they pop up in a circle. Parasitic fungi like athlete's foot or ringworm, which, are, which is actually a fungus and not a worm, they absorb nutrients from living cells. And then mutualistic fungi live in a close relationship with another species, like, pl like uh, plants or algae, that allow them to be able to obtain their nutrition. Um, mycorrhizae covering the roots of a soybean plant is a good example of this. Fungi can reproduce both asexually and sexually. So let's focus on the asexual reproduction of fungi just a second. They can do what's called budding if they are single-celled. So this would be your yeast right? A new cell literally pinches off and develops from the original parent cell, asexual reproduction genetically identical. In multicellular fungi, the, that mycelium, that um, thread-like network underneath the ground can fragment, can break apart, and then that little piece can start growing into a new fungus. That's called fragmentation. Still starting from one parent cell, so the offspring would be genetically identical. Um, fungi also reproduce using spores, and they can do this both asexually and sexually. So in asexual reproduction, a spore grows without fertilization. That is the key idea. In sexual reproduction, the spore has to go through meiosis, and then it has to be fertilized in order to grow into a new fungus. So the sexual reproduction using spores is when you have the genetic variation in fungi appearing. Let's talk about spores for just a second. Spores are a key fungal adaptation for reproduction and survival. They produce a ton of them at once. They are very small. They're very lightweight, which allows them to be carried by the wind. They are covered by a tough, waterproof cell wall, um, which allows them to survive in a, in a bunch of different harsh environments and grow when the conditions are really good. So fungi use spores for reproduction, and that is a key structure in fungi. We talked a little bit about how fungi can have relationships, mutualistic relationships with photosynthesizers. A great example of this are lichens and mycorrhizae. Lichens are a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. So I have a joke for you. What do the fungus say to the algae? If you can come up with the punchline of that joke and show it to me when I'm checking your notes, then I'll give you a bonus point on your homework check. And then mycorrhizae is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a plant. So lichens, we said, are fungus and algae. And basically, they exist sort of as one organism, even though they're two separate organisms, in a mutualistic relationship. The algae are giving sugars to the fungus, and the fungi are obtaining nutrients and providing that for the algae. 
Lichens are very resilient. They can grow in a bunch of different environments, even very harsh environments. So they're a really good, what we call bioindicator. They give us a good idea of how healthy an environment is. If there's lots of lichens, that means that the area is very healthy. If they are um, absent from an area, that typically means that something, something bad has happened there. The environment has changed in a way that can't support a lot of life. Mycorrhizae are fungi that wrap around the roots of certain plants. The fungus absorbs the minerals for the plant and the plant provides sugars for the fungus. The hyphae actually increase the surface area of the plant's roots that allow the plant to be able to absorb more water and more minerals, which results in healthier and more vigorous plants. So you can see these are the plants that are growing that don't have the mycorrhizae around their roots. And these are the plants that are growing that do. So much healthier, luscious looking plants. Fungi are both helpful and harmful. So here are some great examples of how fungi can be helpful. Um, they're used to, there are nature's recyclers, right? Bioremediation, they return nutrients back into the environment. They're used in different types of medicine. Penicillin, you've heard of, comes from a fungus. And then obviously they're, they provide us with a source of food. We like to eat mushrooms. We use yeast to, grow, to, you know, to make bread rise. They are used in make, making of alcohol and the making of cheese. And then fungi can also be harmful. They can destroy plants. They can destroy entire crops. We know that there are parasitic fungi that can infect insects and um, kill them. Then we, we know of athlete's foot and ringworm and yeast infections and thrush. Those are all examples of sicknesses that are caused by fungi. So as you can see, these two kingdoms are very diverse. Um, they are they both belong to the king to the domain eukarya because they have eukaryotic cells and that is one of their defining features so make sure you have all your answers question your questions answered i hope you have a great day